So I thought it was, it was a bit like Hoover, uh, which is the vacuum cleaner. Yes. It's like, I yes. had this image of, uh, of uh, Hoover, your team, sucking up all the dirt that's yeah. been gentle. <laughs> and and you need it clean. That's like, yeah, I'll, I'll go with that. I'll go with that. That Let's works go. for the English markets. <laughs> Let's go with it. All right. So how, how's it going, man? How's your day going before we get started here? My day? Uh, good. Busy, 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 busy. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just many things at once. Um, as you know, uh, we launched uh, this product, the new front end for Magento uh, Hoover. Yeah. And um, well, next to that, I have my day job. So we're, we're building... Um, couple of web shops using Huva. Um, and um, that's, are you spending that's most of the day working on that? Yeah, well, so I'm luckily I'm not I'm not building all of those projects, but uh, I'm trying to to supervise them kind of to see uh, what people run into. And mm -hmm. We kind of have this process where um, we're building the product while we're doing implementations. So I'm getting a great deal of help from Intergenet, my employer. Mm -hmm. um, we have a great partnership uh, where we benefit from each other's efforts. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, so there's implementations and people are doing their thing. And I'm trying to take a peek in uh, once in a while and see where they're at and what they did with it. And then um, try to do my best and not to get too much involved because um, that's definitely my pitfall to yeah. jump in and do everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to both um, keep my vision and, uh, and the direction of the product uh, mm -hmm. in it, but try not to, um, um, not to pull everything towards myself. Yeah. Yeah. It's a challenging uh, thing itself. It's a tough balance, but it's good that like, your um that you have actual people implementing it. like when i saw pj was already implementing it i was like that's mm -hmm. a really good sign and um you know versus yeah, they something work early. That, like yeah um i mean integer they are my friends um i knew them a long while before i started working with them always saw them on conferences and um uh, the guys from argentos uh, same thing like Two weeks back, uh, Jeroen and uh, Peter Ja both sent me this picture from our first hackathon together. And it was um, s seven years ago, eight mm. years ago. Mm. And uh, it was, a, it was, a, it, it's, it was a, um, a special moment for me. Things changed after that, like yeah. seeing Peter Ja doing his stuff in the IDE and I was still working in this dumb coding uh, <clears throat> uh, software that, well, I like the fact that it had FTP built in so I could directly edit stuff on the <laughs> server and right. you don't have all this messing with synchronizing and, right, and right, versioning. Right. So are syncing from the server to my local <laughs> machine and then having a backup, that was my <laughs> my versioning. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we got started with that hackathon and um, PDF was like, oh, yeah, you're not using PHP Storm? I was like, nah, I have this whole workflow and it works for me. And he's like, yeah, yeah, right, right, okay, right. Okay, Let's just okay. get started. Yeah. And I was just looking at a screen all the time and I was, it took 15 minutes and I started to install PHP Storm. Yeah, um, yeah. So we go back and they were the first trusted ones that I that I showed the product and um, um, I knew they have experience with uh, Laravel and Tailwind. And, mm -hmm. um, so they were the pe perfect second uh, guinea pig to get started with it. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was helpful because they were also super enthusiastic. And then you you yeah. know, um, you know you what you're working towards. Um, mm -hmm. And um, uh, so much um, energy has gone into this over the past six months. Um, and. Uh, well, I started because I don't know if you saw the presentation from Reacticon fully, but um, I watched a good I like 30, 40 minutes of it this morning. And then I thought I was, this is the funny thing about that long 
react video with everything embedded in it. I thought I, I had watched like 90% of it. And then I realized there was like a bunch of like Q and a, I think there was a bunch of stuff. So, but I got through a lot, like, cause I was tracking with the slides and then I got to like the end of the slides and I was like, Oh, okay. I'm, I'm almost done with it. But, um, I didn't, uh, yeah. that is started improvising. No, actually the whole thing was improvised, but, uh, yeah, I got some slides. No, no, I said quite a few things in those first slides, but I, I really meant to, um, take as much time as possible to actually focus on the product itself. And yes, yeah. the organizer from, from Yireo, he was very helpful. Um, we, we had this run through the beginning of the week and um, he asked me what I wanted to do with Q&A and I showed him the last slide that I had ready and it said like, no way we got this far and this time left for questions. So uh, we'll do a Q&A later. And uh, he was like, yeah, you know, uh, it's the closure, uh, closing of the, of the conference and um, um, we just we just put it after it and uh, we keep going until uh, until we're done and we make a party out of it. Yeah. So um, yeah, by the way, this great. this feels like the podcast already. Should we get started? <laughs> I thought you were recording already. No, 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 no. I said we're not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was record. I I did record it, but I was I was just kind of catching up before we get started. <laughs> so. Uh, so yeah, so if I'm going to tell the same thing again, it's gonna be less genuine. It's gonna be less that's, genuine. That yeah, for, that's that that like, rehearsed. <laughs> it's gonna sound rehearsed. We'll circle our. We'll we'll weave our way back to it so that it's. Uh, oh man, so that we're, it's organic. We're catching up then. Then, yeah, that was just to catch up. Completely that was just to catch unpolite. Up. I haven't let you talk at all. <laughs> you, you have to. Well, you have to put. <laughs> you have to keep me in check. You, uh, I mean, it's your podcast, and when I need to shut up, you need to shut me up. No, no, it's good. It was really good. I was like, this is great. I, I had a feeling you thought it was a podcast because it was great for the podcast. Um, but uh, Are yeah, you man, sure. It's... You're sure that we that we. Um, that this ain't the podcast. <laughs> you know what? Let's make it the podcast. It is the podcast. Is, I mean, we're, already, we're already into it. Who needs structure anyway? Who needs structure? Yeah. You know what? That's a good point. I like that. I like that. It's, we're, we're in okay. it. And we have two hours anyway, right? We got, we got time. We got time. Yeah. We got some time for sure. Uh, so <laughs> now, now I don't know where to go. With it. But I... Um, Hilarious. So my first question I was going to ask was the word Hiva, which I know I'm pronouncing wrong. I think I just heard you say it. It's uh, uh, but it means in Finnish it means good. Is that is that what it, yeah. is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's one. Um, uh, there's there's a bunch of meaning um, to the word, and it's all positive. Um, the most common one is Viva. So. Uh, during a conversation, do you speak Finnish, by the way? Because I know you're. Nah, you're okay. Nah, I lived there for four years. Um, everyone I hang out with spoke English, mm -hmm. um, so uh, it was basically going to the supermarket and just bluffing my way through it, uh, seeing how far I would get until the the, the cashier. What's it called? Cashier. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. The cashier. Until she would call me, or she would detect my my non finnish roots. So I really tried to get my pronunciation uh, pronunciation right. And, nice. And, but huva huva is just um, um, it's like all a bon in French or good in English. It's like ah oh, good okay let's get going and but uh, uh, more of those. Um, but it has extra meanings like. Um, 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 desirable. Okay. And um, by the way, if it seems like I'm sweating, I'm in a whole new. I had to move my whole setup for my Kate for my shed because it got too cold back inside. So it's like super hot in here. So it's not that you're stressing me out or anything like that. Just seeing. My breath is just a case. So it's like yeah, yeah. So just uh, Hoover had a really positive. Uh, um, uh, emotion or it, it gives me a positive uh, feeling and um, I mean what we're doing it's it's uh, good and desirable yeah it's uh, um yeah so many people's reaction to it has been um super positive right like there's this 
And like, even like there's a lot of emotion in your voice in the presentation around like, man, like, um, and all the tweets you pulled in from the community and stuff of people that are just so frustrated with um, Magento 2 development, whether it's the regular Luma or the PWA or whatever. And then like people are just having a lot of fun with, uh, with what you built, you know, which is neat to see. It's so, and I mean, it's so genuine. Um, uh, I lied awake for, for two months going through um, that presentation because it was, it, uh, I tried to keep my mouth shut as long as possible, uh, not spilling my beans. And, and you did a pretty surprised. good job of that. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm still building tension so that people would still watch without even having a title for the for the presentation. Um, because well, you know, launching a product it's 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 timely. Uh, um, um, you eventually people will copy it uh, better later than sooner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I I mean, I think that's so one. That, that was one thing. Yeah, yeah, but also I I yeah I wanted to have. An impact with the presentation and um, while a lot of it came from the gut um, I'm, I'm, um, I can get sad about the state of Magento community mm -hmm. uh, I can get sad about the choices that are being made uh, that are out of our reach yeah um, we've been struggling for the last two years to get the right solution to bring the best web shop to our customer, to, to the merchants that we work for as, a, as an implementer and developer um, and uh, having fun doing our job. And I spend a great deal of time and energy optimizing uh, the Luma, the, the, old, the old front end. And it was a dead end. Um, um, we, we put a lot of effort in it. Uh, and last year we got great results. Um, and at the beginning of the year, well, like I said in the presentation, Google decided that uh, we're done with megabytes of JavaScript. Um, and, and that's just, that doesn't work for a great experience for your visitor. Um, sending four or even eight megabytes if you're fancy doing PWA, it, it's, um, it takes a while to pull it in if you're not on, on a high-speed internet connection mm -hmm. or, a, or, the, uh, or the phone device. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, if you want speed, you can see the demos are up. Um, we got plenty of it. And um, we're building in more features. And uh, this, so far, there's no degradation in, in performance. So um, one of the responses, um, well, I got, I, I got a handful of people that were skeptic because um, there's just not much in the demo yet. Uh, and we only have simple products. Um, and some features that we're still building out. But rendering a configurable product page, it has some drop downs. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I mean, there's a, some JavaScript behind it to calculate what options they influence each other. First option means you get less options. Uh, if you select a color, there's less sizes. So uh, there's some things there and changing images in the gallery. Um, but that, that all doesn't add up to um, the performance degradation. Um, it's it's a few lines of JavaScript um, opposed to megabytes of JavaScript that you normally find in a library. And uh, we built the whole thing in a way that um, the first render is always a full rendered uh, uh, PHP page. So you get the raw HTML in your browser, server-side rendering, which is the toughest not to crack with PWA. Uh, you get the full HTML to your browser, and then Tailwind, um, the, the CSS library that we use, it generates 50, uh, 35 uh, kilobytes of CSS. And then the, the JavaScript library is 50, 60 kilobytes, mm -hmm. and that's it. And that makes an immediate page render. Like we have a 0 0.000 uh, repaint um, uh, on, on the first page. And everything we do that's JavaScript um, loads after the initial page, like the, the DOM is rendered, and then mm -hmm. AlpineJS kicks in, and they make things dynamic. Mm -hmm. But um, your page is immediately there. Yeah. So. Uh, By the way, this is a this is kind of a minor thing, but on Tailwind, so I, I use Tailwind myself. I love it. It's like so simple. Um, 
but I recently tried to upgrade. Well, I wanted to use one of the newer Tailwind UI components mm -hmm. and yeah. I went in to use it and I needed a new version of Tailwind. So I was like, well, this shouldn't be too hard. There's like a list yeah, of like that. 20 things that you got to do to like recompile your, it, it, it's funny because it made me think of like a Magento upgrade, which like it's the it's the last like Tailwind yeah. is feels so simple and clean, um, but up, I mean upgrades are always complicated when you got to change the way things are implemented. I imagine it's it's uh, it's surprising that Tailwind doesn't do this themselves because if I think of it, it's quite simple. But I think I would write a, a shell script that would just replace. I think some of the things were mm, like uh, makes sense. gap gap uh changed and some well just some some naming conventions i think and mm -hmm. other than that it's not 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 that big of a deal it's just a lot of manual uh changing yeah so if you have the list of what if you can map them there's a shell script you can write it in nice. 30 minutes and we could publish yeah. that to all our customers so right um, right yeah it, that would be nice it wouldn't be that much of a problem yeah um I know I interrupted you midstream as you were talking about the whole uh, kind of the implementation. Oh man, we went into 10 different paths and I started to talk about something and then my mind comes to the next <laughs> thing. And meanwhile, I... now I remember that I was still talking about Peter Yap and then some context completely lost. Yeah. But, uh... I, I wanted to, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the, like the sadness around the Magento community stuff. Cause I, yeah. like, like I said, I felt that emotion in your voice and I felt that myself as well. Um, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people feel that, right? Like you see people moving to other platforms. I think for myself personally, um, I have gotten a little more comfortable with the idea of being, um, kind of a multi-platform e-commerce world. And I'm, I'm getting interested in other platforms and stuff like that. But it took me a long time to even like be okay with that because there's like this yeah yeah cheating like, there, yeah it's cheating right like there's this love that you have for the community for the platform for your history with it and I think yeah. a lot of us like think back to that simpler time when it was just Magento everybody we were all a community that was all just focused on one platform and we had complaints but they were not as bad as the complaints we have now. And, yeah. um, I, I don't know, like, I think it's, I think it's a tough thing, but, um, I also thought it was a little, I thought there was some irony in, um, the fact that like, for example, when you're talking about your wife's shop, like wanting to start a shop, which is why you did this. <laughs> yeah. And that's all oh, you bring me back to. Let me interrupt you now for a second. Okay, that's what okay. I started to talk about. So okay. that was the thing that was the initiator. Yeah building a shop for my wife and meantime yeah. i have a product i have two web shops live and my wife doesn't <laughs> <laughs> so, but i promise her she's getting it uh, before uh, before the beginning of next year right um, right and, that's uh, funny <laughs> yeah but like i thought there was some so like as you were talking about it like in the chat like ben marks was saying i could never imagine using magento 2 for like a small simple store and the whole purpose of your thing is basically like right tool for the job. It's like, hey, PWA is cool, maybe for a Twitter or a Nike or whatever, but you have to pick the right tool for the job. And for a lot of these jobs that we're doing, it's like a website is the right tool for the job. Um, yeah. And I thought it was, it was like on another level, right? Like you're totally right about that, but like on another level, it's like you're wanting to use Magento for something that maybe like, is it the right tool for the job? You know what I mean? Like would a Shopify be make more sense for that simple, simple shop? Yeah. So that, that, that depends also on the implementer, I guess. Um, and I think we're opening back up a space in the market where small agencies and freelancers can jump in. And, um, <clears throat> That's where I got started. Probably you also got started with a smaller project, low budget. You make mistakes, you fall, you get up, you learn. And with every new project, the price goes up. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. with, with current Magento 2, um, that doesn't seem possible anymore. Um, yeah. Especially if you're looking at PWA. Um, 
everything becomes bespoke and the tech stack becomes bigger. Yeah. And it was one of the main things that well, I emphasized on during Reacticon. Um, we're not making things simpler, quite the opposite. Um, and that's not only performance or the, the amount of JavaScript that we ship, uh, the stack grows and um, it gets more complicated. And especially JavaScript, if, um, if you look at the um, traditional front is they're quite intimidated by the amount of JavaScript uh, that's in, in PWS. Mm -hmm. And they're not only intimidated, it's just, it's just hard to grasp some things. And we're not all James Satman who... Uh, I have immense respect. Yeah. Um, I think it's really cool what he does. And I'm super intrigued if I watch him do stuff. And, um, but that's not me. That's not, I cannot perform on that level of uh, concentration the whole day. Um, Sometimes you need to yeah, dumb things I, down a little bit. Yeah. The, I mean, in the end, the, the fun in coding uh, the fun in coding is on the one hand puzzling, figuring stuff out, uh, learning new stuff, and having this feeling of a comp a comp uh, accomplishment that you that, that something worked out. Worked out. Um, and you can have a certain amount of that. I know you code one hour a day now, and it's probably that's the reason because mm -hmm. you need eight hours to think to do something really good in one hour. Um, it's not that good, and, but it's, it's okay. <laughs> it's just a it, but, it, yeah. And the, the rest of the day, ideally, you would fill with things that you've already learned and that go easy. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of fun of, in that as well. To by the end of the day, have accomplished a lot of things. Just build stuff. Yeah. And have it flow out of your fingers. Just smash yeah. the keyboard, and by the end of the day. You build a new feature and you have something you can present to a client. And through the years, Magento has become more of more and more and more of just debugging and debugging and spending whole days of figuring out why something doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And in our experience with PWA, especially with middleware that comes in between, where there's a lot of logic happening on in nodes and processes that we don't understand as front enders. Um, and even our backend has had a lot of issues um, understanding stuff with the PayPal integration where simply data was lost somewhere. Um, and we didn't know it was about a token that wasn't persisted or um, I don't even know, but it took way too long to figure it out. And mm. I've heard stories of seven figure um, projects on, on, uh, on PWA that on a fixed budget that went over budget like eight or nine times. Yeah. Um, on a on a extremely <laughs> um, capable agency. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you can't put that on on um, incompetence. Um, some highly respected people mm -hmm. just not being able to deliver within constraints. And of course, everything is new. We still need to figure stuff out. But this is how are you supposed to do something for a mid-market merchant with this technology? Mm -hmm. um, maybe in four years, but I wonder how much of all that JavaScript is left in four years. Um, to me, it really feels like we're back in the era of Flash development. And I really love that era. Like, I thought that was a free. really interesting parallel that you drew. Um, that you're like, listen, I remember when I was doing Flash and Flex app development and it feels similar to that. Everything is an app. And then it, like for a while, it was like there was a lot of people that thought everything was going to be Flash, you know, like let's make yeah. everything, you know. And it was. We did build everything. I mean, whatever it was, I would build it with Flash. I would build a PHP backend with uh, ModX, uh, a very simple CMS. I would generate XML through that, that CMS and then Flash would read the XML uh, and you would have a full CMS. Um, Flash would render the menu and the content and everything. And it didn't really make sense, but it was a lot of fun to do. Right. But then luckily we had Steve Jobs that pulled the plug and for PWA, I don't know who it's going to be, but um, uh, I have the feeling that there's going to be a point where well, well, 
the majority of people will stand still and, and think, like, what, how did we end up here? But the difference, you know, it's an, it's an interesting parallel, I hope I'm wrong, right? By the way. Yeah, yeah. It, but there, the 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 huge difference is that um, a lot of the like PWA standards are being driven by Google, right? Google being sort of the the company that has the most vested interest in the web. Um, mm -hmm. So, and and it's like you know a PWA by its strict definition is very simple. It's like you've got a a worker and you've got a couple of features you can use. It's like yeah, can be very simple. Um, it's somewhere on the roadmap. So, um, and people say this, um, you, why, why put this on PWA? Because PWA is just a manifest file and a service right. worker. Right. And they're absolutely right. Right. And if you stick it on something that's performant, um, it's a great thing. And having notifications and having background processes to fetch data before someone actually goes to a different page and offline mode, that's all very nice. But currently, uh, PWA is a synonym or a it's represented by JavaScript libraries. Right, right. And um, the promise of PWA is speed and performance, and um, we're not seeing that. Exactly. And um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, maybe the maybe the technology will will move somewhere that. Um, you have a lower payload when you visit a page the first time. And um, I mean, it, it pulls in different content when you start navigating, but the amount of JavaScript that you need to do the routing to just fetch all the data, there's so many different GraphQL calls that you need and you somehow need to um, persist that in the browser. And um, it's all just really complicated and, and it makes me wonder yeah, <laughs> we can talk an hour about how server-side rendering uh, uh, can be built for PWA uh, to fix an issue that 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 wasn't an issue in the first place because the current Magento front end has server-side rendering. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know. Did you get? To, I don't know how far you got in my talk, but uh, I put in a small pun um, that um, I built the first Magento PWS. Oh, I think I might have seen that. Yeah, I think I might have seen that. <laughs> I was surprised that no one, no one got got uh, uh, noticed, noticed or or said anything about that. Is it I just progressive it website? Is that the is that the joke? No, 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 no. So before we do PWA, we should do PWS, and it stands for proper website. Okay. <laughs> I love it. By the way, yeah, your slides, feels, yeah. your slides were great. Like, like uh, the just the storytelling of like the problem you had, the problem with your wife's store. Like, you had a lot of clever stuff in there. Like, don't lose your head and um, stuff like that. In the slides you had, like the light. Uh, it was very data driven. You had all the lighthouse scores. Um, and you know, the launch of your product coincided with it. So I thought your slides and your, and your talk were great. Um, it's been a while since I've watched a tech talk. So I thought you did a really good job with it. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Did you have fun putting it together? Yeah. So it was exhausting. Uh, like I said, I spent two months just laying awake, um, um, having all this information in my head and. The, the small puns that I wanted to, to make and I had these memes and I, I made them up <clears throat> like two months before and um, yeah, yeah. Uh, then I would forget it again and then I would I was just focusing on keeping all that information together and then kind of figure out what the right order would be how to build it up and then how to do the, the reveal and so um, kind of have a, a general tech talk and people would expect me to, to um, do one rebuild and it would be an experiment and then it's a product yeah yeah <laughs> um and uh, it was really good uh, it really was yeah thanks yeah. <laughs> yeah so much um so much went into that um but um yeah the saturday before i sat down and i just spent six hours putting together the slides um mm -hmm. and um that was a lot of fun because uh, then i could literally just um offload <laughs> my brain and uh, 
from there on, I slept a lot better because I, I had a structure. I put everything down that, that, that was living in my head for such a long time. Right. Um, and then, uh, well, of course, you have a bit of tension build up before such a presentation, but I felt confident um, because, well, if you're so deep into material, um, it's, it's harder to stop talking than, than uh, <laughs> to get started. Yeah. <laughs> I noticed I, I noticed that like you tweeted that you were like meditating just before you started the uh the the presentation. And um yeah. I've been I've been um starting to do a little bit of that myself and so I'm always interested. Like I was talking to uh Laura Falco about it and she was saying she meditates. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm always curious to like ask people about, you know, what their meditation practice looks like. Um so I just um I, I tried using um, the app, the, um, which one was it? Not Calm, but the Calm? other one, no. whatever yeah. the other one was. But uh, that was about a year ago. Is it um, with this gong? With the, with the... It's, uh, what's it called? Um, I can't remember. But I tried using that about a year ago, and it has these like five-minute um, uh, like sessions. And so I was doing the mm -hmm. five-minute sessions, and it was like working. And then, um, and then I was like, this is great. So then I like paid for it. I was on the like free version and then I like paid yeah. for it. And then I got like 10 minute sessions and then the 10 minutes was just too much. It was like, okay. I just got like frustrated with it. So then I kind of gave up. That was about a year ago. And then mm -hmm. I kept hearing about it. Da, 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 da. And so recently I just, it's the way I do now is just simpler. I just, I play some music and I just sit and, you know try not to think or sometimes i'll try to like visualize something but mm -hmm. i just kind of do it throughout like like a lot of times before podcasts i'll do it a little bit as well just to kind of yeah get centered a little bit i just know. went for a, a quick walk before we got started uh just spent some time away from the screen yeah so helps a lot i always thought that for me the best way um <clears throat> to empty my head was actually to do something mm -hmm. And uh, I've been on and off doing things like climbing. I did that in Finland a lot, bouldering. So actually going into the woods and put down a mattress in, in the middle of the woods and just start climbing a rock. Um, That's cool. And uh, <laughs> things like gardening or um, uh, when it's sports, I, I really need something that takes high attention, like mm -hmm. uh, playing squash. Because then as soon as you step into the box, and uh, and the ball, <laughs> you hit the ball, you're gone. You need your full concentration yeah. to be in the game. Yeah. And then um, if I if I have an hour of playing squash, um, my my body is drained, my mind is empty. Mm -hmm. uh, that that works really well. Mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of putting putting um, putting everything on hold in your mind. It's not. Mm, I think it also sometimes helps uh, in the process of meditating. To get your mind in order mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily always just trying not to think of something and clean your head but it can also help just focusing on um emotions mm -hmm. um, um if if you're not feeling okay or if there's something and you, you don't know exactly what it it can help just to sit just yeah. to sit and and see why and uh, mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. your body's doing and uh, where the pains are and, um it's um, when was I in Finland? Uh, 12, 14 years ago. Yeah, some maybe some ten years ago. Um, I remember that the first times that I really tried to do meditating was there. Um, my wife was on a, in, a, in a dance education there. She's Dutch, but she she moved to Finland for the dance edu education. I I just followed and thought mm -hmm. it would be fun. Um, and there was a lot of this uh, uh, open-minded business going on there with international <laughs> students. And, <laughs> uh, and uh, I don't mean I don't mean sex and drugs, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, very alternative. Yeah, um, yeah. And that um, that really opened me up for a lot of things as well. Um, um, and I, I remember first time trying to meditating was there with a group of students and they thought once a week in the evening, we we go and do a meditation together and we do a guided one with a recorded session. And 
I remember just sitting there and thinking there was a way I supposed to sit like on my knees and the back straight and um, <clears throat> just really doing it properly. Like mm. there's rules for it. And I just remember my back would hurt and I couldn't get my mind off, off my back. And then my knees started to hurt and then my feet and my, my legs started sleeping. And I was like, Oh my God, this is nothing for me. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, um, so my, my, um, the parents of my wife um, uh, or her father is a teacher in uh, mindfulness. It has been for quite some years now. Oh, wow. um, so we're, we're a bit in that uh, in that area. No, no. Um, and I, yeah, so I, I've learned a bit from that. Um, and um, yeah, don't make it so hard on yourself. Um, I mean, it's all about being gentle to yourself. So why put yourself on restrictions how you would sit? Yeah. If you're more comfortable sitting on your butt, just sit on your butt. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if there's thoughts, just accept the thoughts. Just don't don't criticize them and don't mm -hmm. don't push too hard. And the more time you spend, the easier it gets. But um, now it sounds like I'm just meditating all the time. But I'm just using it whenever when whenever the need is there. Yeah. And uh, I have this whole thing with my burnout year, three four years ago where it was a much bigger thing for me. Mm -hmm. um, Nowadays, my, my mind is a lot stronger. I can endure a lot more. So, um, um, yeah, not not doing it too much uh, yeah. at the moment. But That's good. Yeah, before Reacticon, there's just so much build up that it really helped just to does. Uh, take some calmness before, uh, before jumping in. Yeah, you seem, um, I think this is the first time we've actually talked. But um, yeah, you uh, <laughs> you seem very. I'm just I'm stealing I'm stealing um, the mic all the time. No, no, I no. Just no. like to talk, and no. immediately like there's something that I thought of that I want to say, and I love I'm it. gonna let you talk. Now. No, no, no. I really love it, man. It's that's what that's what uh that's what I'm here for. Um, but okay, I was just so gonna say. I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, you go. No, you go. <laughs> I was just gonna say you do seem very like centered, and even in your even in your talk, like you just seem very kind of centered. Um, that was all I was gonna say. But now I'm curious to know what you were about to say. Yeah. So when I was walking to uh, to get uh, something to eat, uh, since it's uh, Friday evening here, um, just before we called, I was walking. And I was thinking it's maybe a few days apart, but uh, almost exactly a year ago was the first time I met Philip uh, at uh, MLEU. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, almost a full year later, I think that was somewhere four or five days ago, it was uh, I saw on Instagram, I got a rem reminder from uh, like Yogo, uh, where we nice. had this great party in Amsterdam. Nice. Um, so yeah, yeah, the first time Philip, first time you. Um, a lot of first times, everything. A lot of first times, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, jumping back to the um, to Hiva, how do you pronounce it again? Hoover. Ho ho Hoover. Hoover. Okay. Uh, it... <laughs> ah, hold on, hold on, hold on. We I mean... talk about pronunciation. Yeah. You managed I mean... to get me get my attention away from it for forty two minutes. Uh, yeah. I mean... Say my name. <laughs> I managed to go this whole thing. See, that's how that's how good I am without even doing the intro. It's it's Willem. I mean, it's not that complicated, right? Uh, no? yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. Very okay. good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I don't understand the difference how between long, how long did you practice? <laughs> I practiced it like five times. <laughs> okay. I definitely did some practicing, but I don't understand the difference between a W and a V in in the the way you guys pronounce. Okay. Yeah, the way we pronounce it. Okay, <laughs> it's, it sounds like a V I mean, to me. Willem. Uh, what? Uh -huh. What? Uh -huh. Willem. Uh -huh. It's like. I think I, I hear mean, it you now. You have a V and a W, and yeah. it's the same. If you say what, it's the it's the w, uh, Willem. Uh, and if you say very, uh, it's the V. Um, I think I see. I think funny I can... anecdote. So <clears throat> in Finland, they write it with a V. Ville. Yeah. They say Ville. Uh huh. And it's written with a V. V I L L E. Right. Um, right. But yeah, we have a W, same as you guys, and it's pronounced pretty much the same. Okay. All right. 
I'll take your word for and it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I spoke to someone from uh, Space 48 this week, uh, uh, also talking about uh, Huva, and um, <clears throat> he had the same the the, the same struggle that you. Who? How? Hava? How did you just say it? Hava? Hava? I say Hava. That that was the way I thought. Yeah, but then you tried to say Huva. Oh, and then I said Hova. Over. Yeah, exactly. So um, uh, this guy from Space 48, he was like, yes, yeah, so that's my association. So I thought it, it was a bit like Hoover, uh, which is the vacuum cleaner. Yes. It's like, I yes. had this image of, uh, of uh, Hoover, your team, sucking up all the dirt that's yeah. gentle. <laughs> and and making it clean. That's like, yeah, I'll, I'll go with that. I'll go with it. That, that works go. for the English markets. <laughs> Let's go with it. <laughs> Yeah. So how is um, all the traction going? I, I know you mentioned you were talking to somebody from Space 48. There's a lot of buzz. Um, are you getting mm -hmm. some good interest from uh, from people since your launch? Yeah, I'm just stalling. I'm just stalling because um, not that the product wouldn't be ready enough, but um, uh, I got so much interest that um, I didn't dare to do this uh, on a freelance basis. Uh, which originally was the idea to do until the end of the year, at least to keep it freelance, sell a few licenses and then do a proper launch somewhere in the beginning of next year. And then my inbox one day later and a week later um, told me <laughs> I better, I better put up a proper organization. So um, that's what I'm doing. Um, I did, um, I did get a few people in because I wanted some quality assurance um, and uh, have some people put their hands on it and, and see um, if they're... Well, my only, the only thing that I knew was that uh, my employer and my colleagues and the guys at uh, El Gentos, they were super enthusiastic. Um, and... Um, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure uh, if I kind of got the imposter syndrome. Like, is it? I mean, I think it's it's fantastic, and I have so much fun to do everything, and everything seems super simple, and it, it's it's like my own dream. Like, I built my own dream template, and uh, yeah, probably it is for all the well for most developers. But um, what what if I sell fifty licenses before the end of the year and uh, forty of them hate it? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's always. So I think that's always that's always a fear. Um, I was gonna say I think that if you're if you're enjoying the development process and you're also productive, right? Those two things combined, right? You could be enjoying right. it, but you're not getting anything done. But if you're enjoying yeah. it and you're and you're shipping. There's something powerful mm -hmm. there because like you said, it's like, yeah. yeah, of course, as a developer, you're going to have struggles and challenges. But when developers love their tools, when they're excited about the tools, it makes a huge difference. You know, it makes a massive you have difference. To, you have to struggle with the right things. Yes. And uh, they have to be solvable. Yeah. And there has to be an end to it. And the reason I burned out was because the, the, there was no end to the issues that that it would just pile up and um that was magenta 2.0 and there was there was no decompression like i went to sleep and i woke up in the morning with the issues that my customers had and there was no solution there's just constant debugging and there's a lot of stress in it there's a, a lot of energy going into it and you just there's no moments where you can actually relax um and that's Luckily, far behind, and uh, Magenta is at a much better place right now. Mm -hmm. uh, two point three, two point four are really decent. Um, we just have a crap from them, um, but but the the, the back end development um, 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 it, it's it's a nice it's it's nice it's mm -hmm. good it's uh, pretty stable. Of course, there's still issues, um, but. You can see if you put a proper front end uh, before it, it's um, in front of it, it's fast. And um, yeah, it, it's finally the feeling, I got the feeling back that I had 10 years ago building just just bespoke products, just like 
getting started and build stuff and just make things up and mm-hmm. and be productive like you said and yeah of course you're going to have struggles because it's magento there's complexity but that's what drives complexity drives me especially if i can reduce it to something simple mm-hmm. um, but um yeah the, 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 there needs to be a solution to your issues <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah no that's that's cool that you're that you're feeling motivated and, and enjoying the development. Um, you mentioned like your burnout and I remember hearing from you about that and, um, Mm -hmm. you had your own agency if I recall. And, uh, yeah, that, that was, I remember thinking about that from time to time and like feeling like, man, and, and, and I remember you telling me it was, it was kind of Magento too, that sort of did it because you had a couple or maybe one big project and it just, all these bugs and stuff that just kind of killed um, things for you. And I'm, I'm really glad that you're doing so much better now. You know, it's good to see. Yeah, me too. It's, um, I don't know, it has something of a Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> Sticking with Magento. Yeah. Um, but um, there's, there's less and less pain and uh, it's a more healthy relationship now. Um, it's just, um, yeah, I, I hope we can revive more of the community. And, uh, one of the things that, um, you really giving me a kick right now is the, the amount of, um, people that have contacted me that kind of abandoned Magento, mm-hmm. uh, publicly or non-public, um, and are contacting me like, well, it's looks like we might have fun again doing magento stuff and we're super interested to try it again because uh, we miss the great old days of doing magento and um uh, from from what we've seen uh, it looks like it could be fun again mm-hmm. um and um yeah part of part of what i'm trying to do is build a community uh within within the licensees and agencies that will join um we have a handful of them, people that I fully trusted with with having a look at the code and trying it out. So there's a handful of people from different agencies that are currently checking it. Um, and um, yeah, you can already see the interaction and people being excited. And um, yeah, that really gives me hope for the future that we can build out a, a, a proper community and people sharing things. Like One of the downsides of my system is that um, we need to rewrite some stuff for third-party modules. Mm. So the, the presentation layer, so the template part, of course, uh, we won't have required JS and Knockout and jQuery. Um, so uh, whatever plugin you install uh, or module you install, um, it will break and uh, you need to rewrite some of the JavaScript. But um, there also lies the power that we can actually still install plugins. Mm-hmm. And the whole headless thing um brings us into territory where everything is bespoke um there's currently there's there's no plugins there's slowly there uh, some plugin mechanisms are are being uh, put in place but mm-hmm. from what i've seen uh, all the successful pwa integrations are completely bespoke they rip everything out and rebuild it uh, and and uh, there's a lot of custom work involved mm-hmm. and um with with keeping the current front end, we can keep everything that we like and enjoy to work with. Uh, and a lot of those things actually come back from Magento One, the, the XML, um, uh, working with blocks and stuff. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's great. It's a great exercise to simplify those layers. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to really reduce the complexity of the XML. Uh, no no hundred level deep uh, nested. Uh, XML tags um, and um, yeah, keeping the great things that we enjoy and that we know and then use the best tools to get you on your way as quick as possible. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> One of the responses from my colleagues was um, <clears throat> um, the fact that she could actually just build stuff without constraints. Yeah. And the, the basis is solid and with Alpine uh, it's so similar to Vue, so especially if you have experience with Vue.js, you're on your way within a day, you're building components. And we use GraphQL where it makes sense. Mm-hmm. GraphQL is super fast, it can be cached, you can load stuff asynchronously. It's a, it's a, 
it's Ajax calls and steroids. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's that's taking the best part of, of the, the new generation Magento. Um, and uh, at the same time, we have backwards comp uh, compatibility with the old mechanisms uh, like the section data. I know, don't know how familiar you are with the um, customer section data. Well, mm -hmm. listeners that work with it will, will know. Um, we, we, well, in short, Magento keeps um, your, your customer specific data in local storage. It pulls data in with Ajax mm -hmm. and then stores your customer information, your card data, um, such kind of things. It's stored in local storage, and only if it's invalidated, it pulls it uh, pulls a newer version from the server. Oh, okay. Um, so a lot of third party modules uh, utilize that. So, for example, a, a Google Tag Manager, it looks at that local storage data and pulls in the customer name mm. and their items that they have in the cart. And uh, we actually rebuilt one of those Tag Manager plugins uh, within two hours. Nice. Make it compatible with Huva. Yeah. Um, so that's that's just taking the logic that's already there from the old front end um, and uh, strip everything out that's that's uh, that comes from the library. Mm -hmm. So that's that's, that's low dash and and uh, what else? Different things to do manipulations on on objects and arrays. And uh, modern browsers can do all this stuff. So just throw it out. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Like it's kind of crazy how you're saying like so much of 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 what ha what's happening with headless people are just throwing out all a lot of the functionality that they used to have they used to have 20 or 30 plugins and they're just going like let's just get rid of most of this see what we can do without and mm -hmm. build something nice and clean and fast and the ux is clean everything's clean i mean i'm sure if it was simple they would have more features in pwa mm -hmm. but they're just they're not even at the point yet that that they have to base things ready and adoptable and that things won't change and break in the next update uh, and, and uh, yeah the foundation isn't quite feels like it's not quite strong enough you know it's not quite simple yeah and so clear i said enough. this before um one thing that i really appreciate from the magento and adobe side is that they haven't shipped it yet while it's not ready i mean the thing that can get me most upset about Magento is the release of 2.0. It that basically, well, we didn't dive into that and let's leave it also. But um, my burnout had everything to do with Magento 2.0. There was a lot of things around that that were wrong timing for me. But Magento 2 was uh, at the foundation of my my uh, my burnout um, and. Um, I don't know who decided at Magento that they should release 2.0, um, but it wasn't done. It wasn't ready, and they knew it. And they just thought, well, we'll figure it out, we'll push it, and the community will help us get the box out, mm -hmm. and uh, we need to ship it, and we need to start making money with this because we spent too much time uh, developing this. Mm -hmm. So um, the positive thing I want to <laughs> say about this is that they haven't done this with PWA yet. Mm -hmm. And that I really appreciate. Um, imagine they would have shipped PWA a year ago while it wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. um, imagine they would have already started deprecating Luma, yeah. uh, the old front end, and already pushed PWA. It's going to be very interesting to see when that's going to happen. Um, but for me, that's going to be a really hard split when they, when they decide to pull the plug on... The current front end mm -hmm. that's going to move things in two directions um and i don't think that can happen anytime soon because people are just not ready to adopt pwa and i wonder if that's ever going to be the best solution and and uh and, well something that fits uh for for the um, for the majority the use case. Chooses, yeah, for the majority. Yeah. And um, if they would do this, it would mean that they really <laughs> uh, definitely say mid-market, that's, that's not our gig. Um, we're enterprise. Um, we want you to build bespoke uh, and custom-built uh, Magento shops. 
we think you should be technically able to just build with the React components that we have. Mm -hmm. It will get better, of course. There will be teams with predefined components from React, but um, I don't know. It will never become as simple as just building PHP HTML sites. Mm -hmm. And you'll never have less JavaScript than with a PHP HTML site. Yeah. Yeah. And um, more JavaScript will never, I mean, I'm not against modern JavaScript. I love it. And my whole team is about modern JavaScript, but um, as least as possible, mm. always a simple solution. And I want people to be able to read my code and understand it and not dig into 20 different files trying to understand where something yeah. came from. Yeah. So one of the things I was curious about with um, like Alpine, so I'm more familiar with Vue. And mm -hmm. um, everybody seems to love Alpine. My understanding is I, I saw a little bit of your code. Like it's just a simpler version of you. You don't have to go and create components in order to and like can't do base simple logic and stuff like that inside of a template. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw like one of your posts on like how to build a paginated slider and things like that. And like as you like, for example, in my in my code base, I have like a multi-select, like a view multi-select widget that has all sorts of cool stuff that it does. Mm -hmm. But as you like this, so there, so that tension between the simple use case, let's do something simple. It's not ship a lot of code versus as things mature. And if you like, like in the view ecosystem, you have all these like packages and components. I'm sure it's similar to react. There's all these components. You want to multi-select, you want to table grid, you want whatever you want, right? They have all sorts of things you can use. Um, mm -hmm. How does that work with with Alpine, and like, aren't you going to want access to an ecosystem with more of these rich existing components that you can plug in for, for different things? Yeah, so I want to keep things simple and small in the basis. Um, that doesn't mean that you're not able to put complex things in there. You just pull um, it in as an additional secondary thing. Yeah. Yeah, so I imagined when I got started, Alpine is going to replace things that I normally would do with jQuery or I used to do with jQuery. Simple presentation, logic, toggles. Yeah, just UI, UI elements. And uh, I was sure that, for example, the mini card, I would have to build with React. Mm -hmm. And maybe the product page. Um, we did similar things at Intergenet at some builds because the current front end just was such a pain to work with. We just started to build React components uh, that were kind of hybrid. So if we would move to PWA, we'd already have a large library of checkout and product page and all these things that we could reuse. Um, so I I have two years of experience with building React apps. Um, and um, we open sourced the React checkout that we're building, which is an iteration on something that I did before. Mm -hmm. um, it's much more versatile. It's um, super um, um, uh, flexible, like uh, you can go anywhere with, with, with the structure of elements. And uh, I put all the logic up in, in context. So um, it's kind of like a separate brain to the checkout. And then we have dumb UI elements, a simple components that just display stuff and uh, call functions from this brain, the context. Um, and that works really nicely. It's not fully featured yet. Uh, I, I did one implementation for a B2B customer and it didn't need shipping and payment. So uh, it was quite simple, just billing and some custom GraphQL endpoints. Um, and I actually started building that checkout uh, this January, so almost a year ago. Mm. Uh, I wanted to open source it and then uh, COVID happened and uh, um, uh, it was... Uh, postponed for a while and then uh, in June yeah they asked me to build a checkout for this particular customer and then I saw the designs I was like oh man I, I have to use my my side project for this so I just I got asked for the checkout and what they got was a new front end um, but uh, yeah to get back on point um, you can you can build react or view components and pull them into the page and um, you can use all these libraries and even code that you've used. I imagine if you're an agency that does PWA and you do Magento and you're knowledgeable about Magento, you're going to love having the option to work with Huva 
because you have the same backend and the same developers working on the same backend. And the front end is just something simple that you can use to build a web shop in a month instead of six or mm -hmm. 12. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, you can serve mid-market clients or whatever. $10,000 luxury websites. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, um, sure, for, for, for those that just came out of, out of, uh, out of college, for those that are just getting started, they're young, they're enthusiastic, they want to learn, they want to fall and get up again, they can build a Magento web shop with Viva for 10,000 euros and they'll be earning good money with it. It's how we got started. And um, I look forward to, to hopefully see that happen again because currently the entry level of Magento is already somewhere up in enterprise yeah so you already need to have agency with with people that already know magento that can train uh juniors and uh what well, you had to talk with uh, with max uh from from something digital you need a whole program to actually um school you you need to you need to have the the, the money and the time to actually uh, uh train juniors and, um, it's interesting. That's I, not how we got started with Magento One. Yeah, man, it's so funny because in some ways I feel like you're keep. It's like you're keeping the spirit of Magento alive. You know what I mean? It's like Magento is this corporate thing now, and it's the money more and more. It's like you said, that's the bigger and bigger projects. It's more enterprisey, Adobe, and mm -hmm. it's like you're trying to kind of almost revive like that feeling that you had building things when they were simpler, when people could get in easier. Um, and uh, it makes me think of that tweet I posted about like entrepreneurship too, a little bit in America versus Europe, right? Because <laughs> like, yeah. it's, it's, it's like in a way, like you're keeping this, that spirit of Magento alive. And I wonder if it, it's maybe more so alive in, in Europe in some ways, because there tends to be less of the of the uh, commercial edition of Magento. It's more the open so uh, open source version, um, and so it's almost like the price points stay a bit lower. Um, and I don't know. It's just it's making me think about that, you know. Yeah, I don't know too much about the the U.S. market or how what what range agencies are operating in there. But I literally built my first Magento site for a thousand euros. Yeah, I installed a team and I got on my way and it, it, I was still a student, so I didn't need the money really. Um, I was just in it for the experience and to learn. And it got me up to the point where I had an agency where we were doing really well. And Magento 1 was a golden era for us. We didn't build expensive web shops, but we had enough customers, enough builds, and uh, mostly we were, having, we were having a lot of fun. And uh, that's that's the best driver, um, and um, I think I think that's still possible with Magento. Um, up until the point where they where are they going to push PWA so hard that that we have no other choice than to fork it. <laughs> I mean, it's it's possible. That's the thing about an open source community is like you can take things the direction you want to take them. I mean, you ran into all these issues and, you know, some people can just complain, but you did something about it. Like you built something that people can use. We spent two years just thinking what 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 should we do? Because it's maybe hard to understand, but not every agency wants enterprise. Not every agency wants to deal with merchants that have a whole C-level and a CEO and a CMO mm -hmm. that have an opinion because they need to have an opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they need to have this, all this Google Tech Manager stuff and the 100 tracking scripts and, and uh, they push their opinion so hard just because they have the authority to do so and they don't really listen to you when you give the best of, uh, the best advice and you have solid arguments and they push you to build something that fails and then they come back and they say, okay, so maybe do the other thing then. And that's so draining as a developer if you're doing something that you're not behind. Mm -hmm. If you're, um, 
And what, what I enjoy most is when I sit across someone at the table that owns the company, yeah. that invests his life into it, who's passionate about the company, yeah. who, who wants to grow, who wants to learn. Um, and you have a whole different experience with such a merchant. Yeah. And um, they, they also have budgets. You have multi-million companies where the owner is, is, is still actually running the business. Mm-hmm. And that's a lot more fun than, than a hundreds of million company where everything is formalized. And yeah, we just liked the, the, the personal and the, the, the human side of, mm. of, of working. And um, I love that. I, I'm similar in the sense <laughs> that I, I like working with um, my, the customers that work out the best tend to be generally agencies that are where I'm dealing with the owner or something like that. Sometimes merchants too, but um, when, you know, it's this big company and like, it's like for me, it's if they have an HR department, like or if my contact is the HR person, <laughs> like it never, not, nothing ever goes anywhere. I don't know why that is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I love small businesses, you know? Yeah. And they can, I mean, <clears throat> of course the bakery around the corner, all this this um, clothing, well, uh, some shop around the corner shouldn't be a magento because they can't they can't pay the the cost of ownership, the the updates and the, the security stuff um, or the hosting, and they're best off on a SaaS like I don't care Shopify. Um, that's a perfect fit, and we have a few of those in the Netherlands where you get your your POS uh, integrated and you pay. 10 euros a month and you have a web shop and you put your 20 products on there and you sell maybe one product in a week. That's all fine. We used to, I sold Magenta to one or, f- or one or two of those merchants all the way in the beginning. And uh, in the end, we mostly hurt ourselves because they couldn't pay for our services. And we were so humane to still <laughs> fix their issues, uh, issues and, not being able to properly charge them. Um, and that's, that's really a done deal with Magento too. Uh, it's unrealistic. But um, yeah, it brings you back to what's mid-market. But I think um, 10K webshop, well, maybe if there's not too many requirements. Uh, I built a Huva website. If you go to huva.io, I built it the day before the conference. And of course, there's, there's two products in it and uh, the checkout is simple. There's no payment method. But um, I really did some customizations there and uh, integrated and MailChimp and then Google Tech Manager. And uh, it's not just, I didn't just install it and then leave it there. Mm. And also the demo site um, really came together last minute um, because all we had up till a week before Reacticon was projects that we were implementing. Mm-hmm. And little by little, we we would port stuff back into the main product. But the week before Reacticon, I really had to push and get everything in and um, just, just getting a demo up there. Um, well, and this is the thing with, the, I mean, and this was my whole, this is my whole point with that whole $10,000 thing the whole time is that like, Yes, there is this expectation that prices have gone up and up and up and up. And, and especially US-based solution partners, they don't want to hear about a budget that's less than 50, 70, 500,000, right? That's just oh, those cases, it doesn't make sense. That's just that's the, true. That's the expectation. But what I'm looking at from sort of first principles is like, and it goes back to this thing with developers, you know, if a developer has a tool set that they're familiar with, that they know well, that they're efficient in. Then why could why can't they do something quickly if the requirements are not too bad? The client, assu- of course, assuming the client knows what they want, the requirements aren't too crazy. Why not? Why not? And in, in some ways, like you're, sh- it's that same, um, it's the same thrust of like let's simplify, like let's not work with a tool set that we're just fighting against constantly, yeah. just because that's how it is. Yeah, well, in defense of those agencies, 
Um, in the end, a 10K merchant isn't ideal because usually that's their budget. And, um, but then one man, month after going live, that's a security patch. Yeah. I think <laughs> big. Yeah. And all of a sudden, all the categories are empty because some indexer doesn't run anymore and his Elasticsearch broke or something happens with Varnish or, I mean, it's a complicated stack. Mm -hmm. And we learned to do Magento for 10 years and it takes us one hour to fix something, but that doesn't mean you have to take into account that there's, well, a certain... Yeah, it's an expense. <laughs> there's a lot of value to it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, I think a 10K merchant is not sustainable in the long run. Unless you're a student or a beginning agency that's getting started and doesn't have a lot of cost and you're learning and growing, right. but that's not, that shouldn't be where you're, where you finish off. Right. Um, right. But it would be the perfect basis to get started again. Right. And that's something that you saw, at, at least in Europe, you saw this a lot. 10 years ago, eight mm. years ago, six years ago, and then it stopped. There's just the level of entry since Magento 2.0 got higher and higher and higher. And a lot of people just gave up because there were too many bugs mm -hmm. and you couldn't build them. Um, one of my issues was that I worked at fixed prices and uh, well, some things were billable, but I couldn't bill a customer for PayPal being so broken that their stock status changed every day. There was such a core box in PayPal that if someone tried to buy a configurable product and um, um, there was a credit check, you would do a credit check with PayPal for $100. And then after the credit check, you would go to the confirmation screen and you would add shipping. And if shipping would add $20 to your order, your credit card was validated for $100 which became 120 and you would hit a credit limit. So PayPal would throw an error somewhere silently in the back end, would throw the customer back into the checkout, mm. payment fails without any message. You wouldn't find it in the logs. Um, <laughs> and then Magento would say, ah, this is a failed order. Let me put that product back in stock. While that product hadn't even been deducted yet. So there was, mm. If you had a stock of 10, it didn't, it never went to nine, but yeah. it went to 11 or even 12 yeah. when the customer came back with a failed payment. And the customer would think, well, I have enough credit. Let me try again and try again and try again and try again. And then the merchant would call me that for some products, the stock went up with 20 units Brutal. and they didn't sell anything. And that took me like among three or four other bucks in checkout. And this was in a time that they were eBay owned, right? So PayPal and Magento, they were, they, that was basically the same. It was the same company. Yeah. And it was the worst integration of payment that you, that you could possibly see. There were so many bucks. Yeah. Um, and uh, it took me six weeks where the merchant was calling me every day. What's the status on the stock issue? I'm where the whole company is recounting our stock today again. Please tell me that's fixed tomorrow. Oh, God. They needed to do a full stock recount every day. Yeah. And I had this cron job that ran every minute and it would it would store the current stock status in the in the copy table. So I, I would have the stock table and then the shadow table and I would compare every minute what changed oh, God. compared to the minute before with a timestamp. <laughs> and then I would go through server logs and then see, ah, oh, okay, they added this product in the back end, so this is genuine. Ah, okay, here's a canceled order, and the stock went up with two. Oh, okay, so God. I would mark that red and then look into that. And because there were three or four different bugs, uh, bugs in, at the same time, there was no pattern. So it's just like, oh, so I have something here, <laughs> but that doesn't match with this other thing that I just had. So. <laughs> I'm looking at the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's where my brain at some point just, it just melted. Yeah. It's uh, too much. Because we did, we actually did four Magento 2 builds at that time. Um, at, in Magento 2.0 and 2.1. Um, you're, uh, you're taking me back to some, some late nights, like troubleshooting 
like email delivery stuff, like where it was just like really stressful. And like, you know, if, there, if you do something wrong, there's like bad consequences. And I haven't, I haven't had to deal with that kind of thing in a while. So that's good. But, yeah, but the pressure of a merchant calling you every day. Um, oh God. You wake up in the morning and it's the first thing you think of mm -hmm. and you go to bed in the evening and, and uh, you lay awake just just trying to figure out, trying to process and, and understanding what the issue is. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's a limit to that. You can have stress. Stress is a perfectly natural state of being and it saves lives. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that has to be, um, well, you have to be able to offload. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you don't have to back up, I had some developers working for me. They did front end stuff. So uh, they actually made sure that we still had billable hours, mm -hmm. but uh, there was no one to to fix issues if the server just went down in the middle of the night or yeah. um, these kind of issues with Magento 2 that all just came on me and yeah. wasn't sustainable. Yeah. We had 24, 25 Magento 1 customers and I could handle those on my own pretty much. Mm -hmm. Until we added four Magento 2 customers to it, and then mm. nothing was maintainable anymore. Yeah, so. man. I've been thinking about like like kind of the meditation stuff and like mental health stuff specifically for like as developers. I think there are some unique challenges that we face and some unique um, types of pressures. Um, mm -hmm especially if you're in a situation like that where something's down, something in production. And, um, you know, you talked about your burnout. Like I, I feel like I've experienced some different types of burnout as well. Um, and um, I, I think it's something that like people are trying to figure out. And I think, um, I don't know. I just, I, I feel like we have, to. we have to, I feel like they're, Sorry society problem it's a society-wide problem and there's different flavors of, you know there's different ways that it impacts different people differently but i think about it through the lens of my own experience and through like developers or people that i know um and it's like man we have to find ways to work through these things because mm -hmm. sometimes that stress is just it's a lot you know when you're responsible for a production yeah. system with a lot of money that's impacted being impacted um it can cause a lot of and we laugh about it you know it's fun you know i mean it's uh these horror stories are no not anymore you know no. but it can no, be there's nothing to laugh. it can be <laughs> there's nothing to laugh and then you laugh. we laugh because we're familiar with the pain you know it's like it's like yeah. you understand the pain um and you know it's uh but yeah it's but really it's painful. been it's been uh, three years, three and a half years since my last burnout. Um, <laughs> and I still don't do developments without back, uh, deployments without backup. I just, it keeps me sane, it keeps me healthy. Uh, before uh, I do a deployment for a customer, I ask Fabian. Are you available? Something happens. Are you available? And just that, just knowing that just he knowing. is available. Mm -hmm. And if, if the tension gets too high, I can ask him and he can fix stuff in the deployment or whatever, because I know what the deployment system does, but at some point it gets so complex that Fabian will find it 10 times quicker than me. Mm -hmm. And I thought I feel so much pressure for the merchant if there's too much downtime. Mm -hmm. And that's been my whole issue. Like I take responsibility and I make the, the merchant's problem my own problem. And that's mm -hmm. something that's something good, but it's something that's costly. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. you put so much of yourself in it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, it's working really good. I've, I've been super honest about this from the moment that I started with uh, working at Intergenet. It was two years ago. They knew my situation. I was bad shape back then. Uh, my brain just didn't fully work uh, function yet. Um, I was just getting back on track, being able to actually program again, which I couldn't for half a year. 
Mm -hmm. Like I just didn't have the focus and I, I had constant migraines and I, it just programming wasn't, wasn't in it. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I got started with them, I got the safety net where I just told them like, okay, so these are the things that I'm perfectly able to do. And here I have to draw a line and I have to protect myself. And, um, for the first half, half a year, maybe. I um, I didn't take on such responsibilities. I just said uh, the deployment, uh, the release is ready. Someone should deploy it, mm -hmm. and then I took my hats off, mm -hmm. and that's uh, that really helped me um, get back on track. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's still a uh, man. It's still a process. That's um, good though. And I don't it's, know. It's yeah. it's so important to know that your your boundaries, especially if you go through like a situation like that and to communicate those clearly and for your team because at the end of the day if you're putting out a, a lot of code like of course it's great if the developer can deploy things but if you can say hey here are my limitations but here are the things i can do well you can communicate those clearly then um that can be uh that can be a really great fit you know um and it's cool to see like it's cool to see because i remember seeing you, you you're you close down your agency tell me about the burnout and it's cool to see that entrepreneurial uh, streak that you have coming back out with with Hiva, Hova. <laughs> um, <laughs> every time I say it, now it's gonna bug me. It's cool to see that, you know, because like like we there's this term intrapreneur. I don't know if you've heard that, where you can be entrepreneurial but inside of a company. And that's what I think about when I see how you're functioning, you know, at Internet and building out this product and stuff like that. And uh, mm -hmm. it's cool to see that. Like you took some time, you figured out your boundaries and things are going really well. But, you know, you have this desire to create. Uh, that's to create an itch. It's you an know, itch. There's also an itch to, to, to put something into the world and, and yeah. not, just, uh, not just for the sake of a merchant or for the company that you work for. I mean, um, I started freelancing while I was studying in the second year of my study. Uh, I was doing more freelancing than actually going to school uh, starting the third year. Um, I, I worked the whole night to make a deadline before the morning. And then in the afternoon, I went to school to take an exam and then <laughs> get back to work. Uh, that was all possible in your 18s. Um, but um, now we lost the fret. Anyway. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Actually, this is probably a good time to wrap things up, man. This is a really good, uh, this is a really good chat. It was great to catch up. Um, but uh, where is, uh, where's the best place for people to find you online? Um, that's, um, Twitter. Cool. Uh, at Willem Wichmann. I think you pronounce it. Willem Wichmann. <laughs> Willem now Wichmann. we're getting to the last name. <laughs> <laughs> Willem Wichmann. Yeah. Well, or you can say Wichmann. Wigman. I guess that I always say Willem Wigman. Wigman. In my head, that's how I say it. <laughs> that's how I. That's how I think it. Um, that works. That works. And uh, yeah, if you want to check out uh, the new front end that we're building, uh, it's hyva.io. Nice. And how or we talked. Australian would say hyva.io. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and how. <laughs> I know you mentioned uh, briefly sort of some of the features you have left to build like configurable products and stuff like that. Um, are you targeting, when are you targeting to be production ready to be sort of feature complete? Yes. The, uh, feature complete, that's two different things. Right. That is. Um, that is. So well, it's currently so, production ready, but what are the, what are the features that are missing? Yeah, I mean a bunch. Well, um, as you said, I'm building out configurables, um, and uh, that's taking a bit of time because I'm reducing complex, uh, complexity there. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, the way that's written in Core Magento is just hard to grasp, and I want to change that. So I'm not, I'm not just porting stuff from Luma over to, to Viva. 
um, I really try to rethink and see how we can simplify things. Uh, but I have working configurables, and that's almost done. Um, then there's a bit of finalization work on the wish list. Um, then probably I move on to bundles. Um, and then we have some work to do on the React checkout. Um, but um, yeah, stuff that will be missing from the beginning is uh, things like tired pricing, um, compare products. Um, I don't think we'll ever have multiple address shipping. I don't even think BWA Studio will have it. Uh, that's just a done a done thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so that's a few things like that that um, I think serves the five percent of the market. Mm -hmm. Like compare products, I I haven't implemented any shop using compare in ten years of doing Magento. Nobody uses that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, if you have a hardware store and you sell computers, it makes perfect sense. So we'll build right. it, but it right. won't be in the first release. Um, and we'll communicate really clearly what features we have and what you can expect to be in the in the first version. Um, I have a wait list that's growing, um, but we'll start accept, uh, accepting people somewhere next Wednesday. So from the people that are already on the wait list, uh, we'll be accepting uh, some of those next week. So they'll get an invitation to actually buy the license. Um, I'm talking with a few agencies that are interested. Um, got a lot of response of agencies that really want to um, help build it out. Um, also offers to build out the B2B functionalities, so to to make it uh, a Magento Enterprise or Commerce uh, compatible. Mm -hmm. um, some of them that want to work on the accessibility or the SEO part of it, um, I would expect all of the agencies that, that join, that they also share the compatibility modules that we'll build. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, you want to wrap up, but we keep going. Hey, that's um, okay, it's important. Ideas, <laughs> so the idea is that we buy the, uh, build a library of compatibility modules. So uh, if you have this GTM module or block module or store locator, you pull in the original one uh, through um, Composer, and then you install our compatibility module that only adds the bits that you need for the front end. So uh, we'll override the template files in, this, in the JavaScript. So our compatibility module will be really small, um, only replacing the parts that, that, that we need to replace. Um, and um, yeah, part of getting this, this community feel is that we share these modules and they'll be available for anyone that has a license. So imagine we're doing five simultaneous builds. Elgentos told me they're going to do at least 10 next year. Um, there's more agencies that are saying, from what we've seen right now, and also the ones that already, already touched the code, they're saying, this might be the one thing that we're going to do in the future. So maybe not even PWA anymore, or we do PWA and Huva. Um, and if we get all these agencies on board and contribute with these compatibility modules, we'll have a very large uh, library of modules pretty soon. Um, cool. And that also, well, we didn't open source the checkout uh, without reason. Um, that especially, so the checkout that we built is React-based and uh, it's completely headless. So if you're doing PWA Studio, you could even use our checkout. Um, if you use Fuse Storefront or Luma or whatever headless, you can use our checkout, mm -hmm. uh, which opens it up for contributions for anyone that's doing with Gentle. Um, and we'll need to implement uh, shipping and payment there for different providers. And as you know, every country has its own payment providers. Um, so uh, it would really help if um, if we can build it out. Um, Got it. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That sounds awesome, man. Well, congratulations on all the interest in the launch. Very happy for you. It looks great. And uh, yeah, I will talk thanks. to you soon.